This is the BBC. Yeah, hold on. BBC, that's advertising. You mustn't advertise. I suppose you'd cut the BBC. Why not? They cut me off and enough. <laughs> uh, just because I speak better than what they do. They're jealous. Well, go on, try it, cane out the BBC. Oh, very well. This is... Yes, but this is what? Oh, it could be anything. It could be this is Henry Hall. Or oh, it could be this is your life. Oh, it could be... Oh, this is ridiculous. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That's right. You see? It could be anything. You see? <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, take out the is. Oh, dear. This. That's much better. But I still think it's a bit too long. I know. Take out the this. Yes, yeah. right. Off you go. All right. <laughs> there you are, you see. That's more like it. After all, anyone can say this is a BBC night programme. That's not clever. But when you can step up to a microphone and say... <laughs> oh, that's saying something. <laughs> Well, what are you waiting for, then? Go and announce it. Go and announce the program. May I? No, yeah, really. Sure. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Go on. Ladies and gentlemen, whatever happens during the next 30 minutes will certainly be beyond our ken. Among those taking part are Captain Artemis Nightingale, Miss Clotilda Thuggerborn, Kai Brown, Letitia Medlicott. Yeah, what was that Christian name? Letitia. Bless you. <laughs> Lady Diana Blenchworthy, Customs Officer Mervyn Smuggle, and of course Mr. Kenneth Horn, who prefers to remain anonymous. Ladies and gentlemen, Kenneth Horn. <laughs> Hello, good evening. First of all, here's a special message to all our listeners of long standing. Sit down. <laughs> well, now, tonight I was going to talk to you about mirrors and looking glasses, but on reflection I decided against it. So, um, instead, let me tell you some of the things that happened to me last week. On Monday, I was sitting in the office quietly minding my own secretary. <laughs> when suddenly there was a... <laughs> and I noticed that a stone had been thrown through the window. What's more, there was a note attached to it which said, Fred Fudge, windows repaired ten and six. <laughs> Which uh, I thought at the time was rather amusing. <laughs> I've gone off it since, there it is. <laughs> However, on Tuesday, I was supposed to attend the Kensington and District Working Man's Hunt Ball. And my tailor had promised, my tailor had promised faithfully to have my new evening suit ready for the occasion. But as it happened, he only delivered the jacket. Well, naturally, I decided to sue him for promise of breaches. <laughs> And so I popped in to see my solicitor, and he said that as far as the trousers were concerned, I should drop the whole thing. <laughs> On the grounds, of course, that one pair of trousers doesn't constitute a lawsuit. <laughs> Friday, I decided to get away from it all and spend a few days in Paris. So early in the morning, Prudence and I got busy with a packing. <laughs> Arthur. Oh, I do envy you, sir. Going to all them lovely French places, the pig alley, the champs useless. And you know, that famous historical place where they signed the treaty. You know, the Palace of Varieties. Oh, yes, yes. Well, cheerio, sir. Have a good time. Thank you, Prudence. I'll send you a postcard. Oh, sir. <laughs> oh, uh, Prudence. Yes, sir. Pass on where our best is, sir. Wait. Yes, I'll uh... <laughs> Oh dear, it's, it's very crowded here on the quayside. <laughs> oh, I'm terribly sorry, that was my umbrella. Good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, difference. It's Paul. Oh dear, Humphrey Borum Stiff. Are you going across on the SS Maldeman? Yes, and I think we're in for a bit of a rough passage. Oh, why do you say that? Well, I'm not certain, but if it's anything to go by, I hear the captain of the ship is flying. <laughs> is he by Joe? No, by plane. I don't wish to know that. <laughs> Kindly leave the landing stage. Hello, hello, hello. All passengers for SS Maldemer, Kindly proceed up gangway number three. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, 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 silly me. I 
think God was number two. <laughs> Near the coast by now. I can't see a thing for this wretched fog. Has anybody here seen Calais? See any area, yes. Has anybody here seen Calais? Oh, the fog's clearing. There, there it is. Oh, Calais, yes. Hello, hello, hello. We are approaching Calais now. The ship will dock at key number three. We've got to go through all this rigmarole of the customs. I don't mind it at all. I treat it as a sort of game. A game? What do you mean? Well, when they finally put a chalk mark on your luggage, it means you've won. I <laughs> see, yes. <laughs> anyway, the queue seems to be moving quite quickly. Uh, bon dieu, monsieur. Have you anything to declare? Nothing. Then put your case up here on the table. Oh, very well. <laughs> Are you sure you have no clocks or watches to declare? Quite sure. Then I shall have to see for myself. <laughs> my apologies, monsieur. <laughs> Next, please. Well, here's my luggage. Eh bien, monsieur, anything to declare? Well, let's see now. I've got a quarter of a pound of tea, a, a Union Jack. Oh, yes, and six bottles of parsnip wine. Pardon, monsieur, you are bringing wine into France? Yes, that's the reason I came. A friend of mine said to me, if you enjoy a glass of wine, the only place to drink it is in France. <laughs> My uh, apologies, monsieur. Next, please, right. Sarah. Hello, hello, hello. The train for Paris will leave from platform number three. Oh, I'm not taking any notice of him again. Besides, the train is here on platform two. Hello, hello, hello. Have you ever had one of those days when nothing seems to go right? <laughs> Never even touch the bubbles, is it? <laughs> ah, Paris at last. I can't wait to try out my French on someone. Oh, look, there's a rather tray jolly mademoiselle looking into that shop window. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, mademoiselle, she was just wondering... My kid! Sacre bleu, it's Pat Lancaster. <laughs> what are you doing here, Pat? Well, I just fancied a gay, exciting little holiday, and after all, isn't that what makes Paris, Paris? Well, there's a cue for a chanson if I jamais heard of. <laughs> Hotel, the view is swell, but here's the rug. There is no tub. You wash with perfume and degree. That's what makes Paris Paris. Each man is beard for beard. Who are those guys? Their XGI to look correct where air goes. That's what makes Paris Paris. The gay cafe, the Eiffel Tower, the mayonnaise, the Eiffel Tower, the Marseille, the Eiffel Tower, the organ dining on the Tower, and Eiffel Tower. You cannot speak, your French is weak. Just use your hands, he understands, and pretty soon it's more cher. That's what makes Paris Paris. You try to grab a cat and cab. The light is red. He goes ahead and knocks you down quite cheerfully. That's what makes Paris Paris. The horse drawn cars, the Eiffel Tower, the butcher's mark, the Eiffel Tower, the search for art, the Eiffel Tower, the Eiffel Eiffel. You're half alive, you're 85. There's no two shores, you're not moon. Then all at once you're 23. That's what we call Bellamy. That's what makes Paris, Paris. And Paris is home to me. Oh, 
point out. Anyway, Pat, how are you spending the day? Well, I'm going to see all the sights. This guide is taking me round. Oh, well, have a good time. Ready, madam? Yes. Good. Now, over here, we have the Empire State Building, and that tall, spindly-looking thing, that's the Leaning Tower of Pizza. So if you'll just come with me up Oxford Street. <laughs> well, I, I, I think I'll find my own way about Paris. I say, would you like a guide? What happened to the guide, mistress? <laughs> I just thought, well, after all, I, I've got all the truth over here. Yes. And, well, we're having a jamboree. Ah, here come the girls now. <laughs> jamboree? Yes, it's jazz jamboree. Oh, I see. <laughs> now, are we all here? Come away from those Frenchmen, you'll smell of onions all day. <laughs> right! Alligator Patrol! Forward! <laughs> See you later, alligators. Now, now, where am I going to stay? I'll just ask this passing Frenchman if he can recommend a good hotel. Now, there's my phrase book. Now, then... Uh... Uh, guten Tag, mein Herr. Ich habe, ich habe nicht ein Platz und der Zeitung has nicht willkommen. Uh, pardon, monsieur, what does that mean? It means I brought the wrong phrase book with me. <laughs> However, I wonder if you could recommend a good hotel. Uh, certainly, monsieur. Try the Hotel Magnifique. It is, how you say, very discreet. Oh, how do you mean? Even the manager's name is Smith. Is it? I see. <laughs> Well, now, how much is it going to cost me? Oh, about uh, 80,000 francs a day. 80,000 francs. How much is that in English money? Two and seven francs. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's reasonable enough. And uh, many thanks, monsieur. The token of my esteem, I'd like you to have this. Ah, oh, merci bien, monsieur. I have always wanted a German phrase book. <laughs> well, now, that takes care of the hotel problem. Now, where shall I go first? Oh, I know, the Latin quarter. I'd better pop in and get a Latin phrase book. <laughs> So this is Bohemian Paris, eh? Well, certainly plenty going on. Hello. Seems to be a bit of an argument going on here. Take that, Alphonse. You are the cause of all my worries. I challenge you to a duel. Good heavens. Hello, monsieur. Oh, I say, whatever is that for? Nothing. It's just one of our little customs. Well, it's the first time I've enjoyed going through the custom. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, dear, dear, I like that. Don't mind. <laughs> well, I'm beginning to feel quite at home now. It's getting more like Chalfonts and Giles all the time. Oh, who is this coming towards me now? It's a dirty, filthy, bearded Frenchman. Hello? Do I detect the mother tongue? Oh, oh good gracious. I, I beg your pardon. I thought you were a dirty, filthy, bearded Frenchman. Oh, well, we all make mistakes. As it happens, I'm a dirty, filthy, bearded Englishman. <laughs> But then I should have thought you could have told that for me rolled umbrella. Yes, how silly of me. What are you doing in Paris? Oh, me and my band are playing over here in one of the nightclubs. Perhaps you've heard of us. The Quintet de Hot Club de Kidderminster. <laughs> oh, of course, yes. You must be the Duke of Leighton Buzzard. Yes, I have that honour. And what is this nightclub of yours? It's called the Golden Sewer. Quite a <laughs> fashionable little cellar in the place de la Discord. Why not come along this evening? Just mention my name. Oh, well, thanks very much. I will. Ah, here it is. Hello. The Duke of Leighton Buzzard sent me. Oh, come in, sir. Any friend of old Jangle Fox is a friend of ours. Good gracious, this is a proper sink of iniquity. Maybe, but just look at some of those dishes in the sink. <laughs> what the hell? Just sit down and make yourself at home. I'll send the waiter over. Thank you. Uh, well, now, Miss Joe, what can I get for you? I'll have a pot of tea and a plate of buttered crumpets, please. <laughs> I beg your pardon, monsieur. I said uh, a buttered crumpet. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Le crumpe au beurre. I am sorry, monsieur, but you would have to have what everyone else is having. Oh, what's that? Toasted tea cakes. <laughs> Et maintenant, 
Now it is cabaret time at the Golden Sewer. Ladies and gentlemen, we present the greatest cabaret artist of all time, Maurice Chandelier. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And here's a little song with which I've been associated for many years. Fiend, thank you. <laughs> Why do my boots go pee? It happens every spring For that's when my boots go pee Pee Always my boots go pee It makes the birdies sing When they hear my boots go pee As I stroll along the boulevard My boots go flip and flip on Accompanied by the voices of the compagnons de la chanson. Pee, why do my boots go pee? It rhymes with everything, and that's why my boots go pee, pee. It's really quite fantastic, the way the elastic stretches as I walk along. And whenever I take them off, the ping becomes a pong. And at that point I left. Of course, I did have a very enjoyable time in Paris. I must admit that when it comes to entertainment, you can't beat home produce. And so listen to a number by the Malcolm Mitchell Trio. <laughs> a number which I've always believed to be called Miss Corbus in Unpursuit and it's a fromage, <laughs> but which Malcolm says is really marching to Georgia. Bring the good old humor by the sing another song. Sing it with the spirit that will start the world along. Sing it as we used to sing it 50,000 strong. While we were marching through Georgia Hurrah, hurrah, it rings the jubilee Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that made you free So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea While we were marching through Georgia how the darkies shouted when they heard the joyful sound How the turkeys gobbled which our commissary found How the sweet potatoes even started from the ground While we were marching through Georgia Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that made you free So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea While we were marching through Georgia made a thoroughfare for freedom and her train. Sixty miles in latitude, three hundred to the main. Trees and fled before us, for resistance was in vain. While we were marching through Georgia. Hurrah, hurrah, we bring the jubilee. Hurrah, hurrah, the flag that made you free. So we sang the chorus from Atlanta to the sea. While we were marching through And so we come to the special Kenneth Horn documentary feature, Hornorama. Yes, at this time, Kenneth Horn and his team of investigators bring you a factual report on topics of immediate interest. And we present a close-up on motoring. What of the future? And motorists, what are they driving at? <laughs> now, first of all, here are some statistics. A new law has been passed which states that every car traveling over 60 miles an hour must have a driver. <laughs> Did you know that if all the motorists in Great Britain were laid end to end, it would look just like Kingston Bypass on a Sunday? Yes, the big problem is traffic jams. We asked a cross-section of motorists 
what they thought about the problem. 10% said, With all these new cars on the road, one must expect traffic jams. 15% said, With all these old cars on the road, one must expect traffic jams. And 75% said, <laughs> Well, that was a very cross-section, really. However, <laughs> uh, it is unfortunately a fact that uh, only a small proportion of motorists can really be called safe drivers. Not at all. I'm a safe driver. Well, congratulations. You must be very happy. Not really. There's no fun in driving a safe. <laughs> Probably doesn't know the combination, I suppose. Well, <laughs> a great aid to road safety is, of course, the driving test. And standing beside me now is a typical candidate, Miss Angela Tipton Thorker. Now, tell me, Miss Thorker, have you ever been tested before? No, lots of times. But never in a motor car. <laughs> I see. Well, I expect you're looking forward to this test. Oh, yes, rather. You see, I've got a dog license, a radio license, and a television license. And now I only need this one to complete the test. <laughs> Yes, she's forgotten the license to sell tobacco, hasn't she? Never mind. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Talker, and good luck to you. Now then, uh, many unfair things, you know, are said about lady drivers, and they're not true, honestly, they're not. But sometimes these lady drivers are quite skillful. After all, it isn't easier to get a car into a garage sideways. <laughs> now, let's ask a motorist his opinion of the modern car. There is no good asking me, it's just burst. Burst? Yes, it's a bubble car. <laughs> well, now, what are the motor car manufacturers planning for us next? Here's an expert on the subject, Mr. Patrick J. Flaherty. Flaherty. I suppose, sir, uh, it's a common sight for you to see thousands of new cars rolling off the assembly line. That is that. And that's the trouble. We're trying to keep them on the assembly line. <laughs> And what, sir, and what, sir, can you tell us about your new model? Well, sir, our very latest prototype is the Flaherty Mark 12. It starts the journey of a the car. Then if you want to fly, you press a button and it becomes a helicopter. And if you want to cross water, you press another button and it turns into a boat. We're anticipating a very big demand in Manchester. Yes, yes. <laughs> and what happens if you run out of petrol? Well, you simply press another button and it turns into a telephone box and you can call a taxi. <laughs> And then you take out a jackknife and cut up a side. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly, you've got yeah, it there. Yeah. Now, mind you, there's just one choice in mechanical detail that prevents the full-scale production of the Flaherty Mark 12. What's that? It won't work. Oh. <laughs> but it doesn't deter us. We're still going to put it on the market. And we've got our advertising slogan already. Oh, uh, what is it? Flaherty gets you nowhere. <laughs> Rahati gets you nowhere. Drives you up the wall, doesn't it? There. <laughs> well, motoring is a fascinating subject, and wherever men get together, you can be sure the talk will be of cars. So there's nothing like the thrill and joy of showing off your new car to a close friend. Well, old man, what do you think of it? First grave of a splendid little car. You must be very proud of it. Oh, I am. Get up there. What do you think of the colour scheme? Well, I just adore the yellow bodywork. Yes. <laughs> it is rather unusual. And the red mud guard. It's simply heavenly. <laughs> well, thank you very much for the ride. I must be off now. All right, old man. Goodbye, Noddy. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye, big ear. <laughs> Ah, the joys of motoring. Well, that's the price the motorist has to pay, not including purchase tax, of course. Not only uh, can you get nowhere, but when you get there, there's no way to pump. By the way, I hope you're taking notes, so I shall be asking questions afterwards. <laughs> yes, parking is indeed a problem, but wherever he goes, the motorist can rely on the courtesy, tact and helpfulness of the London policeman. Hello, having a bit of trouble, sir? Yes, officer, I'm afraid it is rather a small space. Oh, well, if I was you, I'd pull out and reverse in again. Yeah, sit. Now, hard down on your right hand lock. Bring it right round, right round. That, that's it, sir. Oh, uh, just hang on a minute. I'll move this barrel a bit. Oh, there we are. That's better. Right, there, in you come. Steady, steady. Other lock, other lock, other lock. Back, back a bit. Right. 
Uh, that ought to do you. Thank you very much, officer. Well, that's all right, sir. Now then, I'm afraid you can't park here. <laughs> well, that's all right. You can't have this in this case. Well, well, that's how it is. I can remember the time when the only difficult thing about parking was getting a girl to agree to it, but there we go. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's turn now to driving on the continent. Every year, thousands of English motorists venture abroad with their cars where they had to be prepared to face the excitable and often bad-tempered foreign driver. Felicity. Yes, Sandra. Isn't it pretty here? <laughs> He was in Wilder's house, he wasn't here. Oh, they make me sick. No courtesy at all. Oh, look out. Look out. Here comes another one. What's he on about? Oh, a foreign idiot. Oh, they're just about the worst drivers you've ever seen. They, they shouldn't be allowed out. Andrew. Yes, Felicity. Shouldn't we be driving on the right-hand side? <laughs> Well, it's a good thing that all British drivers aren't like that, particularly those who take part in that most exciting event of the motoring year, the Monte Carlo Rally. So over now to our commentator, Cecil Smith, in France. Yes, I'm standing now on a stretch of road just outside Monte Carlo, where the contestants come sweeping round this rather sharp and dangerous bend. Uh, I needn't tell you that the weather is much warmer here than it is in Britain. I'm in a very good position here to see the race, and I'm waiting now for the first cars to arrive. And as I stand here on this glorious midsummer day, let me tell you something about the Monte Carlo Rally. As you know, it is held each year in February. And... Oh. <laughs> With that, we return you to the studio. <laughs> Thank you, Cecil Snaith. And now to end this survey of motoring, here's a special word of advice to all motorists who happen to be driving in London at this very minute. Be extra careful. My wife has got the car. So I shall have to borrow Kenneth Williams' car and drive myself to distraction, I think. There we go. This is Kenneth Horn saying goodbye for now and leaving you with this thought. Is a depressed Dutchman cheesed off? Good night. <laughs> You've either been listening to or have just missed Beyond Our Ken, a sort of recorded radio show which gave employment to Kenneth Horne and also to Kenneth Williams, Hugh Paddock, Betty Marsden, Ron Moody, Patricia Lancaster, the Malcolm Mitchell Trio and the BBC Variety Orchestra conducted by Paul Fennelly. The script, believe it or not, was written and letters of complaint had been sent to Eric Merriman and Barry Took. However, the onus must inevitably fall on our producer, Jake Sprout. <laughs>